Distinguished Visiting Scholars Seminar Series of the Virginia Tech Carillion Research Institute. Uh, for those of you who have been attending the series throughout the year, welcome back. For those of you who have not, welcome. Uh, this is indeed the final uh, program in this year's series, the 2014-15 series, and uh, we will start up again sometime in late August, early September. So uh, please make sure to check the VTCRI website to see the coming year's posting of distinguished visiting scholars who will be uh, coming in starting in the fall. Um, it's always great when you're ending up a series to end up with a really strong one. Uh, and we certainly uh, have that opportunity uh, today and the pleasure of hosting uh, Dr. Kerry Ressler from Emory University. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce, introduce Dr. Ressler. He's a professor of psychiatry and behavioral science uh, at the Yerkes uh, Center and at Emory University School of Medicine. Uh, he wears a number of hats uh, at Emory, he including uh, serving uh, as the uh, director of the Grady Hospital Trauma Project for studying post-traumatic stress disorder and he's co-directed the MD-PhD program at Emory University School of Medicine for, for a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that's a lot of work, and so he does that on the side while he's not doing a lot of these <laughs> other things. Uh, Dr. Ressler did his undergraduate training at MIT, uh, where he studied molecular biology and computer science. And from there, he went to Harvard uh, and joined the MD-PhD program, where he received his medical degree and did his PhD training in the laboratory of Dr. Linda Buck. Uh, for those of you who are um, familiar with that work, you'll know that name. For those of you who aren't, uh, that work uh, from Dr. Buck's lab led to a Nobel Prize, and uh, Dr. Ressler was right there at the heart of it in the early days, doing some of the really fundamental foundational work on our understanding of odorant molecular receptors and how they're mapped onto the olfactory bulb and uh, what that means for function. Uh, Dr. Ressler has received a lot of recognition for his many contributions. A couple are, he serves as a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. Uh, he's an elected member of the National Academies of Sciences Institute of Medicine, and he also serves on the National Advisory Council of the National Institute for Mental Health. Uh, he serves on a number of editorial boards of some of the leading journals in psychiatry uh, and uh, neuroscience, and as I said, he's very active uh, locally at Emory University in a number of ways. Um, his work uh, started out, as I said, uh, working on fundamental understanding of the molecular genetics of the olfactory system. Some of those early papers are really, really classics. Uh, they led to an appreciation of the topographical patterning of the different odorant receptor gene expression patterns that come from the olfactory epithelium into the olfactory bulb initially. Uh, he demonstrated a very fine stereotype spatial pattern of this map that had not been done before and came up with a working model and understanding of how you could detect a huge number, over 10,000 odorants, by the way this uh, olfactory molecular map uh, maps itself onto the olfactory bulb. Um, he went on to identify a number of genes that are expressed uh, uh, at the level of transcription during consolidation of fear memory, and this has been a very important part, fundamental scientific understanding that has given us keen insights in understanding psychiatric disorders related to trauma and fear. By using the fear conditioning paradigm, he showed both early and late gene expression uh, and how that causes plasticity both in the structure and the functional connectivity of the brain. Another series of major contributions he made was our understanding in the brain neurotrophic factor, BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and how it and its receptors expression change within the amygdala of the brain during fear conditioning. And then he went on to show that related cognitive deficits and impaired extinction of aversive memories uh, in patients with depression and anxiety are related to that change in BDNF expression. Uh, he's gone on to study the startle response as a, potential, as a biomarker, really, for understanding post-traumatic stress disorder, all the way looking at children who have experienced very traumatic events early in life and how you can use that marker later on. And more recently, he's been involved with a series of studies I think we'll hear a little about today, I hope we do, um, <laughs> about inheritance of environmental information transgenerationally and actually mapping a signal onto the DNA of sperm that will jump generations and manifest itself in the behavior of individuals a couple generations out. And uh, for my money as a biologist, this is one of the really important game changers we're looking at and maybe some of the most important work of the century. So I'm very excited to have Dr. Ressler here today, and please join me wow. in welcoming him. <laughs> Thanks so much. 
Thanks, Dr. Friedlander, for that extraordinarily generous introduction, although I have to be honest, I was kind of hoping you were going to go on and give my talk at that point. But, but <laughs> um, it's a real honor to be here and a pleasure to be here. I've had a terrific day, um, fantastic work going on here, and really, really world-leading in many areas, and I can't wait to um, have the discussion this evening and, and more tomorrow. So thanks again for having me. So I'm going to um, walk you through over the next 50 minutes or so um, the work that we've been doing and, and really th that the field has been doing um, to try to f really get a much greater understanding of fear, particularly fear-related disorders, and the human disorder that we of this realm that is most impactful is post-traumatic stress disorder. And PTSD affects millions of people. It, we mostly think about it from the perspective of um, our military veterans and up to 10 to 15 percent of our veterans, um, really since the age of recorded time, have had some version of PTSD. It used to be called soldier's heart and various other things. We've known about it since the Vietnam War as a, as a specific set of syndromes. And over the last um, 20 years or so, a lot of work has been progress has been made. And I'll update you on some of that, as well as how we're interacting the genetics of PTSD with the genetic understanding of the neural circuits. And um, where I want to start then is how fear and fear-related disorders are really part of a spectrum of, of human biology and of survival. And across all vertebrate systems, really all organisms, but certainly vertebrates, share this circuit of survival. And it's the, it's the basic fight or flight survival system. And so what we know is all the sensory systems project into the amygdala, which is what the main air brain area I'll talk about today is. Um, and the amygdala then activates a whole hardwired set of fear responses, and I'll walk through in a fair amount of detail what that's like. But I think in terms of thinking about where does the spectrum of fear across our normal survival and normal life end, and where does um, problematic behavior begin, um, I like this picture from Joe Ledoux, who's really one of the fathers of the field of modern-day amygdala de la research. Um, and what he reminds us is this guy's walking through the woods, and he sees um, this shape that his amygdala thinks is a snake. And my wife and I live in Atlanta, and it's very green, like Roanoke, and we have lots of snakes. And if we'll go on an evening walk, we'll be talking about something, having a nice day, and, oh my God! And she's jumped back, and she's nearly down the street, and it's okay, it was just a stick. It's okay, it was a stick. And then, you know, we think we're fine. We're going a few more hundred feet, and then another stick, and it happens all over again. So her amygdala is really well-tuned to finding snakes in the world. Um, but, what that, but what happens, I think, is sort of a humorous example of what happens to members of our society that are exposed to trauma and which they then generalize these traumas and cues in the world that are not threatening are still interpreted to them as threatening and it changes their whole life. And people with PTSD have significant anxiety, hypervigilance, alterations in memory, sleep, flashbacks. They're constantly haunted by these memories. So here's a woman who we often think of memory disorders related to memory as um, things like dementia, Alzheimer's disease, where you can't form new memories. But one of the main points I want to focus on today is that post-traumatic stress disorder is a place where the memory system works almost too well. You get these fear memories that you now can't regulate or you can't inhibit or make go away. So listen to this woman who had been attacked years ago. You can't get, you, you cannot get those horrible thoughts. It's just a repetitive will that keeps turning and it interferes with your your everything and you're you're sitting there trying to feel happy or try to think yourself happy and just say please take those thoughts out of my head and you you constantly are trying to distract yourself or set up little you know, different props just to try to get those thoughts out of your head. So she's haunted by these fear memories that were laid down in one way one can think of as too strongly to be able to be then flexibly altered with future experience. So just to give you a lay of the, the map work of the place we're going to be talking about today, so obviously this is our a human brain, and I'm an amygdalocentric view of the world, so I'm going to mostly talk about the role of the amygdala and its hardwired response. But before I go there, I just want to remind everybody that there's a whole lot of other areas involved. Um, including the hippocampus, which is the area we most think of related to declarative memory, spatial memory, the what, where, and when of, of our life. But it's also very much involved in regulating memory formation and in regulating recovery from fear. 
and I'm not going to talk about it today, but one of the most replicated biological findings of PTSD is actually smaller hippocampal volume and disrupted hippocampal functioning. And we think that in part leads to the inability to learn safety or, or inhibit fear memory formation or extinguish fear. So part of the recovery process involves that circuit. And then numerous prefrontal cortical areas that are involved in top-down regulation of the emotional response. We can think of it as kind of the, the rational mind inhibiting the emotional mind, and that's where a lot of these things are happening, and there's plenty of that involved as well, too. And as the field is moving forward, we're understanding much more at both the animal level and the human level about how these circuits work. But I'm going to focus on what we really think is the final common output of the fear response and what's been learned about it. So why do we focus on the amygdala? Um, one is because it's robust. Um, two, because it's relatively easy to study. So across the world, people put um, subjects in magnetic resonance MRI scanners, and they'll have them look passively at faces. And what you'll see over and over again is if you are looking passively at a fearful face versus a neutral face, you'll get activation of their amygdala. And that happens across most everyone. But what numerous meta-analyses have showed is that the amygdala is more activated in PTSD, social anxiety, specific phobia, to these fearful faces than in humans without these disorders. So point number one, these disorders can all be characterized at some level at, by increased activation or hypersensitivity of the amygdala. So what do we know about the amygdala? And one of the main, so as far as why we're studying PTSD, I'm going to go into several points today. One is that it's prevalent and important disorder. Two is that it is involved in amygdala activation and that we understand a lot about the amygdala. And I'm going to just give you a tip of the iceberg today. But three, it's involved in learning and memory, as per that, that woman spoke. And so I think these give us more hopeful optimism for understanding the mechanisms of PTSD than many other disorders in psychiatry. I really feel like it's low-hanging fruit. And I'll get into later, one of the other things that makes PTSD unique is that we know when it starts. It starts at the time of the trauma, and it's one of the few disorders in psychiatry where we can control that as well. So what's happening within the amygdala? And again, the human amygdala is in the temporal lobe. In the, in the mouse amygdala, it's very similar structurally. And what we know is a, a whole set of information, sensory information, is coming in when an animal learns to be afraid. And we use Pavlovian fear conditioning, which I'll show you later, where we will pair a tone with a shock. And at the time, the amygdala is receiving information both from the auditory parts of the brain and the pain parts of the brain. And structural plasticity changes at this time such that in the future, these connections are changed. So that in the future, all that you have to have is the tone alone, and you'll activate the same hardwired pathway as normally the shock would have activated. So essentially, you've made this plastic switch in the amygdala so that now the tone can activate the freezing response, the blood pressure response, the hormonal stress response. We, and we can think about this as the soldier who witnesses um, a car bombing or a, a thing blowing up, then he comes back home and he hears a car backfiring, and that same unexpected loud noise activates the same pathway as if the original trauma had occurred again. To break that down a little bit further, we now know the amygdala is really made up of about 10 or 15 different sub-regions. And a lot of research has been going, is going on um, in terms of what are these different sub-regions of the amygdala doing, what are the um, regulatory parts of the amygdala doing. But at the end point, um, what is re relatively well accepted now is that the sensory information neurally comes in through the lateral and basolateral amygdala, that, in, that is then processed and sent to the central lateral, which is then sent to the central medial. And the central medial amygdala then has multiple projections to many downstream brain regions. And what um, is fascinating is the same sets of regions that are activated downstream, the hypothalamus, multiple um, brainstem, and subcortical regions, activate all the same set of symptoms that you would see with a panic attack. So that if you line up the DSM-4 criteria for a panic attack, you see the hardwired, the same set of symptoms that you see if you activate someone's amygdala electrically or chemically. Um, so you see the heart rate changes, the stomach upset changes, the respiratory distress, the arousal, startle response, freezing, etc. And the primary differences between disorders like panic disorder versus PTSD are what are the triggers. So, for example, with panic disorder, people have this set of panic responses, but it seems to come out of the blue. 
Yet we know pe most people who have panic disorder, the very first time they had a panic attack was after a time of high stress or depression or a trauma. But rather than associating it with all the stress that was going on, they say, I don't know what happened. I just felt really awful. And they sort of generalize the cue. So the next time it happens, maybe it, was, it happened in a crowded room. So now I'm afraid to be around people. Or maybe it happened in an elevator. I'm afraid to be in a place where I can't get away from it. And so they become f afraid of fear itself. With phobias, and if I'm afraid of spiders, for example, Dr. Olendick puts snakes on people who are afraid of snakes. <laughs> and he claims it works. All right. Well, yeah. <laughs> but with phobias, if you're afraid of a spider, for example, and um, a big spider lands on you, you have all of these symptoms. You just call it being scared to death. But it's the same downstream symptoms as those panic attacks. And with PTSD, it's clearly the triggers of the trauma reminders. So we study PTSD and trauma exposure primarily in an inner city population in inner city Atlanta. We also work with a number of veteran cohorts, um, but most of the data I'm gonna show you today from humans comes from this cohort. And we've over the last 10 years studied over 8,000 people um, who are going to Grady Memorial Hospital, which is the largest charity hospital left in America. Um, and these are folks going to general medical clinics or OBGYN clinics, et cetera. And we just interview them while they're, while they're waiting there. They're not coming for psychiatry. And it turns out it, it is an ep a nice epidemiological sampling of impoverished Atlanta. And um, the, the basic demographics are it's about 90% African American. It's um, about 95% well under the poverty line. Um, it, they've had enormous amounts of trauma. 90 to 95% of the cohort has had ex extreme levels of trauma of some variety. 50% know somebody personally who's been murdered. Two-thirds have been attacked. Over a third have had um, some level of childhood trauma. So it's a very highly traumatized, high-at-risk population that has a lot of PTSD. We find rates of post-traumatic stress and depression around 25 or 30 percent. So um, you know, the first thought is, well, Atlanta must be a pretty awful place to live. <laughs> but in fact, it's, uh, Atlanta can be a great place to live. This is the, the, what this is about is about um, poverty. And we see the same numbers if we're looking in Washington, D.C. Um, areas of poverty, if we're looking in Baltimore, if we're looking in Detroit, if we're looking in parts of Boston, parts of Chicago, parts of LA. It's an endemic problem in the US where we have these very large um, poverty differences. So that's, we're trying to understand the population both by understanding civilian trauma and PTSD and understanding the intergenerational cycles of risk. And I know that's also interest to a lot of folks here. So I um, look forward to more conversations around that. On top of um, characterizing their trauma, characterizing their PTSD, we're looking at the biology. So we're looking at genetics, um, trying to do whole genome association studies to say, can we study the whole genome and see different genes associated with PTSD? Can we understand how the brain is working, et cetera? So how do we make sense of all of this? Um, well, first of all, we don't think PTSD is a thing. We think PTSD is what happens after multiple sets of risk factors together Put, switches how one's brain is responding to the world around them. So first of all, the biggest question is why do some people develop PTSD? Maybe after a significant trauma, maybe 10% of people will develop PTSD if you've seen somebody murder right in front of you or you're attacked interpersonally or raped, et cetera. Probably about 10% risk versus about 90% risk recover. So the first question is why does that 10% um, get worse if recovery seems to be the, the, the norm? Well, one thing we know is genetics. About 30% of the risk, based on twin studies, is, is differential genetics. That, um, but those genetics are only acted on if the trauma is, occurs. So if one lives in a trauma-free world, um, you would never know if you're at risk for PTSD or not, for example. The other is child is environment, particularly developmental environment. We know that early childhood trauma, which is a risk for everything in psychiatry, is one of the biggest risk factors for PTSD. And we think that what's happening is that um, Early childhood trauma increases basically the sensitivity of all of these fear systems, the amygdala, the hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex, so that then if you have another trauma as an adult, you're at more risk for developing PTSD. The total trauma load, the total number of times someone's been traumatized certainly increases the risk as well. One thing that's particularly interesting is how the brain differentially responds in the immediate hours and, and days after trauma exposure. And I'll talk later about data of how we can block fear memory formation. And one thing that's particularly exciting for therapeutics and intervention is if we had ways, either talk therapy or drug therapy, to prevent fear memories from forming in the first place. And I'm not talking about you burn your hand, yes, you should avoid the stove. We don't want to erase or make someone amnestic. But we want to separate normative fear memories from these overwhelming fear memories that then haunt you for the rest of your life. 
And in the same way we have stroke protocols and heart attack protocols in emergency departments, wouldn't it be great if we had biomarkers that told us who's at risk for PTSD versus not, and therefore could we intervene in those early hours in the ED or on the battlefield? So I'll tell you about some of that kind of work. Once fear develops and, and, the, and acute stress and then post-traumatic stress develop, you have all the symptoms of PTSD, and a number of different cognitive components seem to also be associated with labs across the world combining. And schizophrenia has done this well um, with like 500 labs. They've discovered over 100 genes that are all very strongly associated, and with PTSD regulates the cortisol response. So FKBP5, again, this is a gene that regulates the glucocorticoid feedback system. And the take-home message here is we, we, we found this gene associated with PTSD a number of years ago when we were looking at all of the genes involved in the stress axis. And this particular polymorphism was quite interesting because although when we looked at total adult trauma, we did not see an effect, we had this very specific interaction of child abuse. And so what we looked at is low ver none versus some versus a lot, basically, of moderate to severe physical, sexual, and emotional child abuse. And what we found with this gene was one version of the gene was looked like the population as a whole. The more child abuse you had, the more PTSD you had after an adult trauma. But with low levels of child abuse, um, you didn't see anything. But the other version of the gene seemed to be a resilience allele, such that high levels of child abuse didn't increase the risk at all. And what we now understand is that these two versions of the gene alter the way glucocorticoids, cortisol, activates the feedback system of the cortisol receptor. So we're starting to understand the mechanisms at the gene level of the stress response. And what's interesting is, again, you only see it as a function of child abuse. And we think that's because cortisol is particularly important in shaping the brain during development. And so we think that this is um, acting on critical periods of development when the brain may be particularly sensitive to stress responses. And so that some genes that interact with the stress response may be only show the gene by environment interaction in looking at the developmental risk for trauma versus the adult risk for trauma. If we look at this gene in adults, we see differential decreased activation of hippocampal functioning and increased activation of amygdala functioning. PACAP is a receptor, PAC1 receptor is an interesting one because we found that this was associated with much higher rates of PTSD in females with one version of the gene versus another, but in males we didn't see any effect at all. And we know that we, with both depression and PTSD, we have about a two to one female to male ratio. And part of that is explained by differential exposure to trauma, but part of it we think is estrogen mediated. And what's particularly interesting about the PACAP receptor is this polymorphism that mediates increased risk for PTSD in women but not men lies right in the middle of an estrogen response element binding region in the DNA that regulates PACAP. And what is now known is that PACAP is both a stress responsive gene and an estrogen responsive gene and that these two different versions of the gene lead to differential estrogen sensitivity of the stress response mediated through this. And again, the risk version of the genes associated with increased amygdala activation and is associated with overall t t um, lifetime trauma. So there are many examples like that, but this is give you a sense of how we're thinking about these genes interacting differently with the pathways. I want to dig a little bit deeper and talk about how we can use animal models to identify new pathways that are involved in fear regulation and fear consolidation. So again, this is another way of looking at the amygdala, where we have multiple different subunits, and again, the um, subregions, and the, the, the fear information or the sensory information is coming down through the lateral amygdala. Um, into the basolateral, and then um, projects to the central and out to the medial. And the, re the gene I'm going to tell you about is in this region of the centromedial um, specifically that um, is involved in the fear output pathway. And one thing that was particularly exciting and novel about it is that there hadn't been genes identified yet that targeted that population. And part of understanding the biology of anything is to be able to dive deeper and deeper into the mechanism. So Roland Darrow, so this paper um, came out in Neuron last year, um, Roland Darrow was doing gene array, so he was looking at all the genes expressed in the mouse amygdala um, following a home cage control or a, fear, a prior stress and then fear condition PTSD model. And he looked at genes that were differentially expressed, and one of the top genes was this TAC2 gene. And again, this is what we think is really excited about its expression. So if we, if we um, another way of sh drawing the, the central lateral versus central medial shows that a Andreas Luthi in, in Basel, Switzerland had a pretty big paper a few years ago in Nature showing that there were two different populations in the central lateral. A fear off subpopulation marked by PKC delta and a fear on population 
um, I mean, the fear off was PKC Delta, the fear on was unknown, but maybe CRF. But those projected to the central medial region of unknown origin. And TAC2, interestingly, is expressed specifically in the central medial region that we think is the main output nucleus of the amygdala. And you can see here how it's complementary to both the PKC delta and enkephalin, which are, so it, um, which are in both in the central lateral. So one, it marked a population that was specifically the output population. That was really cool. And we saw it was differentially expressed with fear conditioning. So how do we study fear? So in a mouse. So normally what we do is, um, so this is again classic Pavlovian conditioning, we'll take a mouse and habituate them to a context, bring them back um, the next day, and now play a cue. In this case, we might play a tone for 10 or 20 seconds, beep, and then at the end of that, they get a shock. And you do that 10 times, and then you can bring them back the next day, or you can bring them back six weeks later, and they still show fear specifically to the tone. And we measure the freezing. So what does that look like? So in this case, the mouse on the bottom was genetically modified to not learn fear, and the one on top has a normal fear response. So tone comes on, you see that guy runs to the corner and freezes, and he's barely moving except for breathing, and the one on the bottom continues to explore. And I'll play it once more. And so we can then use video tracking software to, um, to quantify the freezing behavior. And you can imagine that they freeze in the wild because most of their predators, the snakes and the birds, use movement to detect their prey. Okay, so we can do that. And so Raul asked, so there was another thing that was particularly interesting about TAC2. Its receptor, tachykinin receptor 2, um, is the NKB receptor. And there was actually a drug that had already been identified years ago and tried in schizophrenia. Um, even though there wasn't a real strong hypothesis, um, they thought the pharmaceutical company thought at the time the NKB would be a good peptide to target for schizophrenia. So they made a specific drug called a sanitant um, that targets the NKB receptor. Well, it didn't work at all, but it was really safe. <laughs> so, so there's out there this FDA approved drug that's really safe that has no target, I mean, no function. So Raul said, well, if it targets my receptor, that I, um, that I found the gene that's differentially expressed after fear conditioning in this PTSD model is expressed in exactly the right part of the amygdala. I hypothesize that if I can block that receptor with this drug, um, I'll block some of the fear conditioning. So he gave the drug at several different time points. He gave it before fear conditioning. He, then he gave it 10 minutes, one hour, four hours, and 24 hours. And then he waited and brought them back. And basically what he saw, that if he gave it right before or right after or even up to an hour after fear conditioning, he didn't make the animals totally amnestic, but he markedly decreased the fear conditioning. And in other studies, he went on to show that if he did more of this PTSD model, they had a normal fear response, not an overreactive fear response. So this was interesting to us. This suggested that it blocked fear consolidation. You could give it up to an hour later, and we now have some data that you could do it a little bit later, and that memory is decreased in its formation. And again, the, I didn't really say what consolidation is. What we know about memory consolidation now is when a new memory occurs, when you make that pairing of the tone and the shock, there's initially a very rapid molecular change at the level of the synapses. But over the course of hours, that change leads to gene expression changes. But then over the course of many hours to days, you get structural changes and new synapses form so that it becomes a structural representation. And there's a whole host of molecular events in those minutes to hours after the trauma is formed where the memory becomes instantiated. And by understanding those molecular events, one can then manipulate them. And we think TAC2 is part of that process. So we went on to test this in several different ways. He then targeted the drug with neural... With, um, cannula surgery so that we're only giving the drug to the central amygdala. And he trained the mice to be afraid, looked at their freezing levels, brought them back the next day. And again, the animals that had the sanitant directly into the central amygdala now showed less fear. He then did a genetic um, approach where he made a virus, and this is one of the very cool things about modern day molecular genetics. You can pretty quickly you know, design and clone a virus to overexpress a gene or knock down a gene in a brain region um, as, you, as you needed. And so he made a virus that overexpressed this TAC2 gene that he'd, he'd found um, versus a control green fluorescent protein to make the cells green. And then he waited a few weeks for the gene to be expressed and he trained the animals. He trained them to be afraid and then, as we predicted, because if we knocked down the gene, we had less fear. If we overexpress the gene, we now have more fear. So he's able to push fear up and down by modulating the receptor, um, by modulating the expression of this peptide as well as its receptor activation in the aftermath of trauma. 
And finally, he showed that this overexpression was acting through this receptor by doing a combined experiment. So first, he replicated um, the first experiment. If he gives the drug, he blocks regular fear levels. If he gives the TAC2 overexpression, he increases regular fear levels. If he gives the overexpression plus the drug, he normalizes fear levels. Again, suggesting you can push it up, push it down, and that they're interacting. So the take-home message of this set of studies is that there are um, molecular events happening in the immediate aftermath of trauma. And there are probably hundreds of these things, and we're looking at a number of different ones, but this is one example that by using an unbiased approach, we can find genes that are expressed in the right part of the amygdala involved in consolidation and can target those genes. And occasionally, we'll find genes and, and receptors for which there are already available drugs. And using those available drugs, one can then enhance the um, process of recovery or block the overlearning of fear, potentially leading to new approaches to preventing PTSD in the first place. So I want to move on to what do we do when somebody already has chronic PTSD? They had their trauma a year ago, 10 years ago, um, or other sorts of fears and fear-related disorders. And I want to tell a little bit of an older story, but it's one that I think is, um, is exemplary. And this is um, enhancing extinction of fear. And again, it's using a repurposed drug that's already known to be safe in humans called decycloserine. So let me tell you about it. So first of all, what is extinction? So when, when Pavlov defined extinction over 100 years ago, he defined it as the, um, the decrease of a condition response after repeated non-reinforced trials um, of the condition stimulus. But importantly, it's not the same as forgetting, and I'll show you some data. But what it looks like operationally is if the conditioned response is, say, freezing, the mouse freezing, um, or a human calvonic skin response, or a human um, f saying they're afraid, it could be any of these things, you pair the shock and the tone, and so with each pairing, the animal shows more and more freezing or fear behavior. You then bring the animals back the next day, and now you play the tone over and over again, but now without any shocks. The animal behave, learns or habituates in his response such that after a while, he's not showing any freezing behavior anymore. The tone keeps coming. He's not getting the shock. Okay, I'm not getting the shock. Maybe it's safe. If you bring them back the next day, now the animal that's been extinguished shows less fear than the one that's not. So it seems pretty obvious. But the thing is, most people just think of this and say, sure, you know, you, you learn it. But how do you learn it? And what we know is now that it's not the same as forgetting, but also what's important is that this is likely the mechanism underlying exposure-based talk therapy. And this is the mechanism of therapy used that is the most common therapy for phobias, for panic disorder, for obsessive compulsive disorder, and for, for post-traumatic stress disorder. And in PTSD, what it is, you're talking about trauma, and you talk about it, and you talk about it, and you talk about it. You activate the fear memory, but the bad thing doesn't happen, and over time you get better. So... Um, the NMDA receptor is one of the best-known molecules involved in learning and memory. So I said during the immediate aftermath of a memory event, you have molecular changes, and part of that's the NMDA receptor. It's a glutamate receptor that responds to both um, um, depolarization, of it, so the cell being activated and local glutamate at the synapse, and the um, amygdala is chock full of it. And when calcium flows through this receptor, a whole host of second messenger events and molecular changes occur. So Mike Davis's lab, who's really one of the leaders in the field um, and was my mentor and really one of the grandfathers with Joe Ledoux and Mike Fanzalo of uh, outlining a lot of the function of the amygdala, um, they showed um, about 20 years ago that learning to inhibit fear or extinguish fear is an active learning process that requires the NMDA receptor. So they took rat rats, they trained the rats to be afraid of lights, and then every time they, played a, they showed the light, the rat would show fear. In this case, they used fear-potentiated startle, but it's very similar to freezing. So they had this level of fear. Then they gave animals 60 lights in the absence of any, um, of, any, of any shock. So this is their extinction paradigm, and they brought them back the next day and said, did they remember the extinction? And sure enough, they did. They're now not afraid. But the cool part of the experiment is they could take a parallel group of rats, similarly train them to be afraid, but now give them, at the same time as the extinction, in the 60 lights, a drug AP5, which blocks the NMDA receptor. When they then bring the animals back off of drug the next day, they're just as afraid as they ever were. And that works whether you put it in the amygdala or give it in the whole animal. It means that you have to activate the NMDA receptor in an active way to learn to inhibit the fear. And that if you're not making new learning events happen at the time of exposure, you don't learn to inhibit the fear. You're stuck with the old fear memory. So we argued, could you flip this in the other way and enhance NMDA-dependent learning and enhance fear recovery? 
So instead of giving 60 lights, because we would have a floor of no more progress to make here, we only gave 30 lights. We trained the rats to be afraid, and then we gave this the um, first saline, but with 30 lights. And when we brought the animals back, um, they had about middle level of fear. So we had decreased the fear some, but there was still plenty of fear left. So we could sort of titrate how much extinction to give them. But if you do the same thing in the presence of decycloserine to enhance the NMDA receptor function, and I don't know that I said that, what that is. So decycloserine is this um, drug that had already been shown to be um, an active modulator of the serine glycine regulatory site, and it makes NMDA work better and calcium flow through better. So if you enhance the receptor um, at the time of extinction and bring them back the next day off of drug, now they show less fear. So you've made extinction work better, you've enhanced the learning of inhibition. So the reason we chose decycloserine was because it had already been shown to be safe in humans. In fact, the cyclic moiety of serine blocks um, certain bacterial translational machinery where they're making new proteins. And so this had been a first-line tuberculosis agent in like the 60s. Um, but it um, had also then in the 80s been shown to enhance NMDA functioning at a much lower dose. So at about 2,000 um, milligrams a day, you need that for antibiotic dosage. At about 100 milligrams a day, you get enhanced NMDA functioning. So how could we ask in humans then with this safe drug, can we enhance extinction and make extinction work better? So we brought people back um, and did virtual reality exposure for fear of heights. Barbara was one of the leaders of the virtual reality f um, exposure um, area. And the, what's great about virtual reality is whereas talk therapy is messy and everybody does it a little differently and talks about different things, with virtual reality, everybody can get the exact same exposure, can get the same testing, and can get the same follow-up. And so we brought humans in and we had them wear this virtual helmet. These were all people with fear of heights was the first study. They went up to 19 floors, walked out on this catwalk, held the bar, and looked down at the lobby below. Now, <laughs> now if you're not afraid of heights, my kids look at this and say, that's like a really bad video game, Dad. <laughs> and it's true. And, um, but what's interesting is um, your amygdala, in the same way that in the beginning that stick makes my wife jump every time, if you're afraid of heights, this bad graphics still makes you afraid of heights. You stand in the little elevator and you shake a little bit and then you walk out and you look down. So, um, so it activates that system. So what we were able to do is the whole study was two pills. People came in, they got one pill before each exposure therapy, then they left. And we did it two weeks ago, then we tested them. And we tested them a month later and three months later. Take home message, those who received the, the drug that made the learning work better got better much faster. They had much more reduction in fear. The placebo, they had essentially no effect. We had shown that they already knew that it took six or eight sessions to normally get better in this fear of height paradigm. And in this, we were able to show that we had as much gain in two sessions as normally took six or eight sessions. So that was really exciting. There was a lot of excitement in the field. Um, we were able to show that they were, had less galvanic skin response. They were more likely to go up bridges, et cetera. Rick Richardson, in the meantime, had done multiple studies in rats replicating this effect and showing that it worked on consolidation. So since that study, there's been about 10 positive trials in a number of different psychotherapies that all use exposure-based psychotherapy, that all use exposure-based methods. So whether looking at social anxiety, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, both of these cases, the decycloserine groups got better faster. Um, and PTSD, a study by Agnes Van Vinneman showed that um, the people who were, had milder symptoms all got better at similar rates. But the people who had more severe symptoms improved faster with decycloserine and with panic disorder similarly. So there's been, two or th there's been several negative studies as well. And there's, it's overall, the, it has survived three different meta-analyses. Um, the negative studies we think occur for several reasons. One, increasing data, a paper that just came out in American Journal of Psychiatry showed that decycloserine, if people are on antidepressants already, they don't have the effect. And we're trying to understand there's some interaction between SSRIs and NMDA receptors, so that's an important thing. Also, what we know from um, Stefan Hoffman and others' work is if you don't have good within-session extinction, um, so if this process doesn't work well, then you don't consolidate the memory to hold it the next time. And um, so when studies look at everybody, they don't. So there's a number of things that are starting to be understood. I have no idea if decycloserine will or won't be a long-term um, drug. It probably won't be because it's, 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 already, it's a generic drug that's available. But it's exciting because, um, because we think it's uh, changing the way we can think about using drugs, not giving one every day, but specifically at the time of, of 
therapy to make the emotional learning of therapy work faster. So the last slide on this part um, is a current study that just finished up using virtual reality for um, PTSD um, from Iraq veterans. And this um, was study was published this year, and what we found, all the people got better, so we think we had a floor effect where there was too much exposure therapy and the virtual reality worked really well. But what we could show on both cortisol measures and startle physiology measures, again, where the decycloserine group looked like they got better than the placebo group. So we're hopeful that as we understand more about the system, um, that this is an example where we can target learning in a, in a rational way. So what about other ways of targeting learning. We knew about an MDA receptor, we've known about it for a long time. But if we could understand specific cell populations in the amygdala that encoded the fear memory, that could open up a whole new way of targeting specific um, drugs and pathways. And so this was another study by Andreas Luthi that really changed our thinking a number of years ago. So what they did was they took um, rodents and they recorded from specific neurons within the basal lateral amygdala. And um, they asked, are these neurons responsive to fear? Or are they responsive to safety or whatever? And what they found was about 30% of the neurons didn't respond to anything in a fear conditioning paradigm. About 30% they went on to call fear or fear on neurons. And those when the tone was neutral didn't do anything. But once the tone had been paired with shock, those neurons fired a lot. But once the, neurons, once the animal had been extinguished to the tone, they now didn't fire again. So the, the neurons that they called the fear neurons seemed to only replicate when the animal was afraid. But a, another group of neurons they called the extinction neurons, or the fear off neurons in the BLA, those didn't respond to tone alone. They didn't respond after extinction. I mean, they didn't respond after fear conditioning. But after extinction, now that they responded to the tone. So it was as if these neurons somehow held the fear inhibition memory that we just talked about was NMDA dependent. So when they took all the cells, they found after fear conditioning, one set that was the fear off responded high. The fear on were like a prepotent population that didn't respond. But once you extinguished the fear off neurons, now this neuron held the fear memory. I mean, held the extinction memory. So there seemed to be two ex opposite theories about how these neurons could be come to be. One is that there could be a whole population of pyramidal excitatory neurons in the amygdala, and they could be either fear neurons or fear off neurons, and it or extinction neurons, and it just depended on the random occurrence of information coming into it. So, if this if, if neuron A was active at the time of fear, it didn't matter its its behavioral origin; it could just be one or the other in a stochastic way. An alternative hypothesis is that there are circuits set up that are entirely distinct within the basal lateral amygdala that encode either the fear aversive pathway or the inhibition pathway. And one hypothesis is the fear off pathway is also the appetitive on pathway because we also know the BLA projects to the accumbens as well. So we were um, um, using optogenetics, and for time I'm not going to show um, that, but it's a very cool tool that. Um, developed primarily by Carl Dyseroth in which you can turn cells on or off with light. And I'll leave it at that, but we can talk more about it if people want afterwards. And so um, we, were, we were getting optogenetics up and running and happened to have the thigh one mouse. And what's interesting about the thigh one promoter is it's expressed in a number of cortical layers, or cortical areas, though, one specific layer. Um, and in the temporal lobe, it's not expressed anywhere except for the basolateral amygdala. And what it looks like is that it's expressed in a specific subpopulation of neurons that are kind of spread throughout the brain but it's expressed in that same population in all the different animals. And interestingly, it's only in about half or a third of the CAM kinase um, pyramidal neurons, so it's a subpopulation of these. And we wondered, is this subpopulation meaningful? Um, when we um, tested whether, whether the system worked, so the way we did that was, at, was um, this is all work with Aaron Jasnow and, and Tig Rainey at Emory, we um, act activated the cells with the light, and every time we activated the cells, they fired. But what was interesting is if we looked for the flow through of information through the amygdala, when we activated the lateral and recorded from the central medial the output pathway, normally you get this set of firing on about half the cells. So when you activate the lateral, you get a central medial output. But then when we activated the specific subpopulation of BLA neurons, it looked like it totally silenced the flow through. So that was unexpected. We expected to, we would expect to summate or enhance the flow through of amygdala function. Furthermore, Joe Ledoux's lab had just had come out with a paper where if they put optogenetically, just generally with the virus, activated random cells in the BLA, it enhanced fear. So we expected to enhance fear. 
So what did we find? We found the opposite effect. Aaron trained the mice to be afraid with an opti with, while optogenetically activating this set of neurons in the basal lateral amygdala. When he trained them, and, and so every time they got a shock, they also got the light, but that was the only time they got the light. When they learned to be afraid, they were fine, but when we brought them back the next day, they basically showed no fear whatsoever. So this is the opposite effect we, we expected. We thought we were activating a specific subpopulation, but in fact, we're blocking their fear memory and we're blocking the flow through. Could this be the extinction on neurons? So we then um, trained the animals to be afraid again and then tested them. But now during the extinction testing, um, we, he gave the laser at the time that the shock would have happened. And when he does that, all the animals show within session extinction, but again, you bring them back the next day, and the animals that have now received the activation at the time of extinction now show again no fear. So it looks like we're activating a subpopulation of pyramidal neurons that are acting like the extinction neurons and not the fear on neurons. So that's really exciting to us. Kenneth um, McCullough has done more work with both dreads, which I'm not going to talk about, but for those of you who know what they are, it's another way of showing um, activating the cells. And when we dread activate the cells, we enhance the extinction. If we use optogenetics to inhibit the cells with um, halo rhodopsin, so instead of activating, we're inhibiting them. Now you inhibit them, and now the animals are more afraid. So if you enhance their activation at the time of fear learning, you block fear. If you enhance their activation at the time of extinction learning, you enhance extinction. If you block their activation at the time of extinction, you block extinction, and they're more afraid. They're acting not like a random population, but like a very specific subpopulation. So we're doing more work on this, but I'm just going to tell you right now what some of the final things that are cool about this are, that if um, another group from Memphis has made a, a, a PTSD animal model, and, and when they give, um, I mean, a traumatic brain injury animal model, and when they do a 60 PSI blast to the head and then train the animals to be afraid, they stay afraid for longer, they don't extinguish. So again, PTSD, extinction deficits, TBI, enhanced reason for PTSD, et cetera. But what's cool is they looked in the thigh one animal and they have a specific dropout of the thigh one neurons in the, PS, in the um, TBI model. Now, why would that happen? We don't know. It may be that they're more sensitive to the inflammatory response to traumatic brain injury, but it suggests a potential mechanism by which you have a deficit in recovery from fear in um, TBI. What Kenneth is doing now is cell sorting these populations and then doing gene expression analysis to specifically say what genes are expressed in the, um, this thigh one population. And he's found a whole host of genes that look specifically like they're in the sphere off population. And double labeling and in C2 look like that's what they are. And we, we had a couple cases already where we've targeted receptors we never knew about um, with known drugs and have been able to push up or down fear in a predicted direction based on the expression of genes in the specific population. And what it holds for us, we hope, is a way of doing very targeted cell based therapies in which you're targeting drugs to increase or decrease firing of a known cell population that's involved in regulating the fear. Okay, so um, in my last few minutes, I want to tell you briefly about this olfactory model because I've walked you through fear writ large. I've talked about everything that happens after you've grown up, um, how these different genes um, put you at differential risk for PTSD, alter fear consolidation, alter recovery from fear. But again, what about this idea of intergenerational cycles? Um, Rachel Yehuda has probably done the most work in, in some of the mechanisms in humans where she's looked at, followed um, Holocaust survivors and their offspring in the next generation for decades and over and over again has shown that offspring of Holocaust survivors are at higher risk for PTSD themselves, they're at higher risk for depression. Michael Meany's shown work on intergenerational risk and in inner city populations we find multiple pieces of evidence for intergenerational risk. The problem with it is how do you study it? Um, even within our own population, we find that if we're doing physiology of startle in our inner city kids, their level of startle response can be ent most entirely predicted by mom's history of childhood physical abuse, such that if the mom had high abuse, the kid has a much higher startle than if the mom has low abuse. And this is quite replicable, and um, even if we don't look at any other variables, that's a very interesting finding. But it could be explained in lots of different ways, right? So certainly parenting is where our brains go first, I think, that the PTSD parent is going to behave to the kid in a different way than the non-PTSD parent. Also, by observation, we know that socially, if we watch an anxious person, we can learn to be anxious, and certainly as a kid. They're, they also have a shared risk environment. The kid's growing up in the same dangerous environment as the mom. They have shared genetics, and I already talked about 30% of the risk is genetic. 
but it still leaves open the possibility of epigenetic inheritance. And is there, are there possible ways in which in certain subcases that experiences of a prior generation could alter the next generation? But the problem with this is we need a tractable system because the stress systems are generally too nonspecific. Okay, so I grew up in the olfactory world. So let me give you a 10 second, a few second overview of what we know about the olfactory world. There's about a thousand different odorant receptor genes expressed in the nose. But as each and each receptor neuron in the nose expresses a single receptor gene type. And each receptor gene type projects to the bulb in the brain, and all of the neurons expressing the same receptor type converge to a single glomerulus. So I'm, I'll get to you in a minute why this is an interesting model. But what it allows, it's, one, it's the only sensory system for which the molecular identity of a receptor also encodes the odorant receptor function and the receptive fields and the patterns of projections in the brain. Peter Mombertz, a number of years ago, had made a transgenic mice in, mouse in which a, one particular odorant receptor neuron was labeled with LAC-Z that made the animals blue. And so you could follow these axons all the way into the bulb and see their glomeruli, again, the first neurons in the brain from the um, olfactory representation. We know the odorant ligand for this. It's called, it's an odorant receptor, it's an odorant called a pseudophenone that smells a little cherry-like. And if you take these mice, adult mice, train them to be afraid of cherry and wait a few, day, and wait a few weeks, this is what their brains look like. And again, we know the amygdala changes, we know the hippocampal changes, but also all the way at the level of sensory systems, you change the structure of the brain when you learn to be afraid of something. And so once you've learned to be afraid of this odorant, now there are more neurons in the nose encoding the odorant and more axons going into the bulb encoding that odorant, and the animal is more sensitive to that odorant. So Brian Diaz in the lab, well, there's a little bit more. So this just shows the tr uh, more another experiment, the trained group versus the untrained group. And it's, you see this increase in size only if you do the training, the acetophenone paired with shock. You don't see it with the, the odor alone. You don't see it with a different odorant paired with shock. So it's not the stress. It's the combination of the odorant plus the stress. This odorant doesn't activate these receptors, and you don't see it in a home cage. So Brian Diaz wanted to know, because of things I won't go into for time, would this be transmitted intergenerationally? So he took these mice that had now been trained to be afraid of an odorant. He mated them a few weeks later. And then he looked at the next generation's offspring um, that had never been exposed to the odorant in their life. If the offspring were um, from home cage fathers, this is what the axons look like. If they were from propanol, again, another odorant that doesn't activate this receptor, they look the same as home cage. But if the naive offspring were from the fathers that had been trained to be afraid of acetophenone, this is what their brains look like. They inherited the structural representation of the enhanced sensitivity to the odor that they were afraid of. Um, if we then tr mated these, this generation, again, kept them naive their entire life and mated them, their next generation looked the same. The um, offspring from acetophenone-trained grandfathers had large, no, more axons and larger glomeruli than the propanol-trained grandfathers. And if you looked at their behavior, you could do a double dissociation. So the acetophenone um, grandchildren startled more to acetophenone than they did to propanol. The propanol-trained grandchildren startled more to propanol than acetophenone. What we think is that we're increasing the sensitivity of the inherited offspring. How we think that may happen, why teleologically, is that if one mouse can potentially smell 100,000 things, but really only needs to smell a few hundred, since it's because that's in the last few generations in this particular region of the you know, field, its, gener its parents and its grandparents all were sensitive to those prey and those um, predators, it would certainly be nice to have that enhanced sensitivity somehow encoded. He showed it also works in females, so this is um, it, with, with the offspring of females that were trained to be acetophenone sensitive um, compared to controls, and it goes with the biological mom and not a cross-fostered mom. And the nail in the coffin was to be able to take the sperm from fathers after they'd been detrained, take the sperm across campus to the transgenic facility, had them use that for in vitro fertilization, um, and the animals in the facility had no acetophenone, and showed that that was sufficient to engender the same phenotype independent of any behavior. And finally, we know that DNA methylation is a mechanism by which genes are turned off, turned off in their expression. Um, and he showed that if we do um, bisulfite sequencing, so a way of looking at the methylation of the receptor in the sperm genes, 
um, we could, sperm DNA, he could show that there was decreased methylation of the acetophenone responsive receptor, whereas there was no change in methylation of a different receptor. And in a replication cohort, um, also showed this decreased methylation in this group and a neighboring receptor that's also a sensitive to acetophenone. There's methylation in the comb cage and none here. Again, suggesting that somehow the signal's getting to the sperm, leading to decreased methylation, and that, and then in the next generation, that's escaping reprogramming, so that in the next generation, this decreased methylation may lead to increased likelihood of expressing the M71 receptor over a different receptor, leading to increased number of neurons and increased receptor sensitivity. So this is new data, um, most recent data suggests even more impressively we think that if you extinguish the animals before mating them, um, you can actually reverse the phenotype. So we think it's hopeful and may suggest even similar to data that I know people have here in humans that if you can do treatments of stress-related disorders before conception, you may actually be able to help decrease some of the increased risk that could go on to the next generation. So I've talked about data across a full range of fear disorders from, from preconception through um, early developments and how genes can interact at each of these points. And our, the take-home message, I think, is that there's been a large amount of progress in the field for understanding the circuitry of fear, and we hope that this will be really translatable and that PTSD may be one of our most low-hanging fruits in the field of psychiatry. So um, the work that I've shown you is really work of many people, and I'm just the cheerleader. The um, intergenerational work is Brian Diaz. The TAC2 work is Raul. Um, the genetics work is by a whole host of people, particularly led by Elizabeth Bender from the Max Planck, and thank my funding sources. Thank you so much for your attention.